And then we have uh, Professor Robert Bob Richards, the Morris Fishbein Professor of the History of Science at the University of Chicago, where he was himself educated and has spent his entire career, and indeed holds positions there in the philosophy, history, and psychology departments all. He's the author of several books on evolutionary theory, including Darwin and the Emergence of Evolutionary Theories of Mind and Behavior from 1987, and The Meaning of Evolution from 1992. He's going to be interested particularly in speaking on Darwin's displacement of intelligent design. Without uh, too much fear of being redundant, uh, I'd also like to thank Pat ba uh, Bateson and the other organizers of this wonderful array of speakers and topics. Two distinct approaches to Darwin's accomplishment, uh, especially concerning human beings, uh, can be found in the literature that has proliferated in the last several decades and certainly in the last year. One approach seeks to estimate that accomplishment by, by looking back from the, uh, from the present and by assessing contemporary evolutionary theory and trying to find the roots of neo-Darwinism in Darwin's own work. Uh, the other approach attempts a developmental analysis of Darwin's construction of his theory in order to appreciate uh, the character of his conceptions as they first appeared in The Origin of Species and The Descent of Man. Generally, but not inevitably, these two approaches have been taken respectively by philosophers and contemporary scientists on the one hand and by historians on the other. Uh, these basic approaches seem to me to be roughly represented by our two principal speakers, Dan Dennett and John Brooke, and they offer a complementary understanding of Darwin's accomplishment, even if these approaches often clash in their assessments. Uh, very briefly, let me sketch two areas of concern where there is some dissonance between the approaches, namely the general character of the evolutionary process as Darwin conceived it, and the related understanding of the origin of human moral behavior. Uh, my effort here is really to try to recover that theory as Darwin originally formulated it. There's a deep sense in which Darwin was a conservative thinker. Ideas he formulated early on, uh, seldom did he completely abandon them, but often reshaped them and transfigured them uh, to adjust them to that matrix of ideas that had developed over the course of his career. It was very much a process of dissent with modification. His early ideas thus often played out in his published work, though sometimes unobtrusively and in various guises. Darwin's idea of progress is one such idea. Some scholars like Stephen Jay Gould and Michael Geislin have maintained that Darwin's theory is antithetic to the idea of global progress. And this view has certainly gained considerable currency in the evaluation of Darwin's theory. But Gould and Geislin, I believe, read much of neo-Darwinism back into Darwin, though not a neo-Darwinism of the sort embraced by the likes of Dan Dennett. A reading of Darwin's notebooks in conjunction with The Origin of Species shows pretty clearly that Darwin believed that from the ancient times to the present, ever more progressive creatures replaced less advanced creatures. In his E notebook, in an early entry for December 1838, he writes, my theory certainly requires progression. Though Darwin had no secure notion of the criterion of progress early on, he remarks that if a bee were to pick the most advanced creature, it would undoubtedly pick one that had well-developed instincts. However, Darwin's reading of Henri Milne Edwards supplied him with a workable criterion of progress. As he wrote his friend Joseph Hooker in June of 1854, the specialization of parts to different functions or the division of physiological labor of Milton Edwards is the best definition of highness in animals. Uh, such division of labor uh, was produced, according to Darwin, by natural selection. And this is why, in the origin, uh, he could pronounce with great satisfaction, and here quoting a singular passage in the origin, as natural selection works by and for the good of each creature, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. Uh, that phrase, uh, incidentally, that uh, natural selection works 
by and for the good of each creature, uh, stands out in the origin. There are five or six or seven variations of that same phrase in the origin. But if you think about it, um, at least according to our contemporary lights, natural selection does not work for the good of each creature, where uh, natural selection eliminates most creatures, destroys most creatures. But I think it's Darwin's moral uh, perceptions that have so coated over the development of the notions in his book that he is apt to say things like that. Dan Dennett, in opposition to Gould, has reconceived natural selection as an algorithmic device, which for Dan means that natural selection will search out any good tricks by which to deal with the environment, and indeed, constantly better tricks. Dan, though, indicates that this does not mean that selection has some predetermined goal or end. The lack of final purpose is certainly true in our modern conception of the evolutionary process. I don't, however, think it's true of Darwin's conception, though most scholars certainly believe that uh, this notion of lack of determinate purpose in the evolutionary process is the very hallmark of Darwin's accomplishment. John Brooke has been alive precisely to this other dimension of Darwin's thought. In a series of essays, he's observed that from the beginning, uh, Darwin believed that the creator promulgated natural law and that secondary causes, of which natural selection would be one, worked out the consequences of divine providence. Now, John points out that uh, Darwin, by the time of the origin, had abandoned his um, view of providential uh, operations in the universe, but he did retain the notion of creation through law. And indeed, even in the original manuscript of the origin, there is that passage that uh, John quotes uh, and Darwin pens, in which he says, by nature, I mean the laws ordained by God to govern the universe. This passage receives authentication, as it were, from Darwin's remark in the autobiography. When he wrote the origin, in, uh, when he wrote, he says, that when I wrote the origin, I believed in a first cause that is an intelligent mind. But the evidence, I think, takes us further. Namely, not only did he retain the notion of an intelligent lawgiver, he also retained the notion of the, that those laws were designed to achieve a final purpose. That is, natural selection as operating in a lawful way had the purpose of achieving a particular end, namely, human beings as moral creatures. This, I think, forms the general structure of the process of evolution as depicted in the origin of species. Of course, Darwin's theory has typically been interpreted, especially by philosophers such as Dan Dennett, to be antithetic to any such construction. I'm not even sure that uh, John Brooke would follow me quite this far in the direction that I'm going. If we move back to the notebooks, it's clear that Darwin has adopted the common language available to him at the time, namely the language of final causality. Uh, this is clear from his annotated perusal of such books as William Ewell's History of the Inductive Sciences, which devotes some considerable space to the idea of final causality. Let me give one salient instance of this. Now, here's a passage from Darwin's notebooks in an entry for November of 1838, thus after he's read Malthus. In this entry, Darwin formulates an explanation of sexual reproduction as opposed to asexual reproduction, what we would call clonal reproduction. Darwin writes, my theory gives great final cause. I do not wish to say only cause, but one great final cause of sexes. For otherwise, there would be as many species as individuals. Darwin seems to think, but by asexual reproduction, each individual would be comparable to a species. He goes on, we see it's not the order in this perfect world, either at the present or many anterior epochs, but we can see if all species, that is, if each individual were as it were a species, there would not be social animals, hence not social instincts, which as I hope to show is probably the foundation of all that is most beautiful in the moral sentiments of the animated beings. If man is one great object for which the world was brought into present state, and if my theory be true, then the formation of sexes rigidly necessary. Now here's a full-blown application of final causality. Namely, sexual generation is explained by the goal it will finally achieve, namely the production of social creatures, and with the production of social creatures will ultimately come uh, creatures having moral sentiments. 
This one great object, as Darwin calls it, plays a significant role in his justification for the suffering and death that the struggle for existence introduces into the world. He concludes the origin with a naturalized Christian justification for evil. It occurs in that great peroration of the book, which I think is probably familiar to everyone in the audience here. Uh, it's a passage he had been honing since 1842. He writes, thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object, that is the most exalted purpose, which we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. Thus, the object or purpose of the war of nature is the production of the higher animals, the most exalted of which, of course, are human beings with their moral capacities. Darwin claimed to Edward Aveling, uh, the consort of Karl Marx's daughter, that he gave up Christianity by about age 40, which would have been around 1850 or so. This is an event that Jim Moore connects with the death of Darwin's daughter, Annie. Thus, Darwin retained his Christian convictions, weak as they may have been, uh, long after the basic argument and the frame of the origin of species had been laid down. Even when he published The Origin, he could still claim a belief in the governance of nature by an intelligent mind. This kind of external evidence strongly supports, I believe, the, what the internal analysis reveals, namely that Darwin's conception of nature, which supported the working out of his theory, retained the purposive framework that he had constructed over the previous 20 years. One feature of his early theorizing, which he quite obviously retained as a fully explicit conviction, was the need to account for the distinctive trait of human beings, namely their capacities for moral judgment. His early, no, his early notebooks and his least, uh, loose notes are replete with ideas about the moral sense. And these, of course, came to coherent and systematic attention in The Descent of Man. And I'm not going to say very much about the complex character of Darwin's moral theory. Um, uh, Phil Kitcher has alluded to that. Uh, Phil, uh, from um, his earliest notebooks, Darwin conceived the moral sense as a social instinct. In The Descent of Man, he maintained that it arose in human beings supported by high intelligence, language, and habit. He thought of moral action as altruistic, and thus it didn't benefit the individual exhibiting the action, but the recipient of the action. In that sense, it was unselfish action, and that's, of course, the advantage that Darwin ascribes to it in The Descent of Man, that his view, as he says, is not comparable to that of Bentham and Mill. It is not a utilitarianism. I am indeed coming to an end. Um, and that's quite appropriate if I talk about final causality. <laughs> the end, of course, is that Darwin did e elaborate a moral theory. And it's one that I think fit well within this conception of the evolutionary process as having that determinate end, namely us as human beings. I think this analysis that I've just briefly given suggests that Darwin was both a child of the 19th century and the progenitor of creative biological thought in the 21st. Thank you.